and his fellow followers of Jesus traveled far and wide in the book of Acts. As they journeyed, they continued doing what they had always been doing, preaching and living the word of God, healing the wounded, breaking the bread. It was never-ending work, but they were happy to do it. They felt a certain peace in what they were doing, despite the persecution they experienced at the hands of the Roman citizens. In today's story, they are in Philippi. When they arrived, they came upon a woman named Lydia, who was a dealer in purple cloth. She was a woman of means, and God opened her heart to the word offered by Paul. She and her household were then baptized, and she invited Paul and his fellow travelers to her home for rest and hospitality. They remained in Philippi for some time, and so they would go to the house of prayer every day, and each time they went, they ran across this raving slave girl, as the text describes her. She was known for her powers of divination and truth-telling, and her owners made a great deal of money off of her gift. She had taken to roaming certain stretches of road through the city, which just happened to be on the way to that house of prayer. And try as you might, you just couldn't miss her. She was kind of like that eccentric woman who is most likely experiencing homelessness that you pass on your way to work, the one who yells out random things at unexpected intervals, the one you may have tried talking with a time or two before, but you know that can lead down a rabbit hole and you don't have time for that, so you try your best to just ignore and not make eye contact or acknowledge her existence in any way so you can get on your way, even though you are feeling guilty because you know that she is a child of God. So yeah, Paul and his friends, they just pretended not to hear this slave girl as she yelled out, these, are, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Which, if you think about it, is kind of funny because I don't think any in Paul's group could dispute what she was saying. It wasn't like it was something they were ashamed of or something they didn't want anyone else to know. It was kind of their calling card because they were in the business of sharing the good news of Jesus who brings salvation. And yet, for some reason, they didn't like her saying it. Each time they walked past her and her voice would raise, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. It grated on their nerves a little bit more. And finally, Paul just snapped. He turned to the girl and without bothering to actually look at her and look into her eyes and see her, he yelled in the direction of the demon who possessed her, saying, I order you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And that very hour the demon left. What Paul did was a good thing, right? Surely, healing the slave girl of the demon that possessed her did her good, right? Of course, it meant that she no longer had the power of divination and that angered her owners as they no longer had a source of income, prompting them to report that Paul and his companions to the authorities for disturbing the peace with their rabble-rousing, who then made sure that Paul was arrested shortly thereafter. But all of this makes Paul a hero, right? Like I asked earlier, what Paul did was a good thing, right? I want to answer yes, but I keep going back and thinking about that slave girl, which leads me to a little detour I want to take at our story. I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, but we often come across passages in the Bible that use language we may bump on, and this is no exception. There are two words used to describe this person, slave and girl. Since we know the importance of recognizing the individual, I think perhaps the word enslaved rather than slave would be more appropriate because she is more than just an adjective. The other thing that rubs me the wrong way is that she was called girl. Was she a girl? I mean, when we think of girls, we think of children, right? And they don't really talk about how old she is, but I I don't know, I just get the feeling that she wasn't a child. 
And because our society even today refers to fully grown women as girls, and it often irks me because, well, fully grown men are called men, this slave girl henceforth is going to be referred to as the enslaved woman. Perhaps we won't so easily dismiss the enslaved woman as Paul dismissed the slave girl. So returning to Paul, Paul just seemed to feel annoyance at this enslaved woman, at what she was saying, at the volume she was saying it. And what I can't get out of my head is that it was his annoyance that finally propelled him to acknowledge her existence in any way. Except he didn't even acknowledge her. Not even then. What he acknowledged was the demon that was possessing her. And that doesn't feel right. It feels icky to me that in the midst of all of that, Paul never saw the woman. He didn't look into her eyes. He didn't see a child of God. He just saw the demon that possessed her and told it to get lost. I can't help but wonder what happened to this woman. Why didn't Paul bother to actually look at her, to see her? When I read the story, it seems to me that Paul did what he did to ease his own discomfort, to relieve his own annoyance. He didn't do it to free this enslaved woman. And since he do it, didn't do it for her, I worry about what happened to her. And we don't know, because as far as the book of Acts is concerned, her story ends right there. Her demon-possessed body had served its purpose in getting Paul thrown into jail so we can learn some pretty cool things about Paul. It's a biblical case of fridging. Have any of you heard the term fridging before? Any of you who may be familiar with comic books may recognize this. Its origin is in a comic book storyline where the Green Lantern's girlfriend is killed by his nemesis and stuffed in a refrigerator. Henceforth, fridging is the practice in storytelling where a woman is killed or raped or depowered in some way in order to move the man's story forward. Because, of course, the man is the hero and therefore the point of the story. The woman is just set dressing, and so there is no need to make her a fully developed character in her own right. Looking at this story of the enslaved woman, especially as it is presented in the book of Acts, she really serves no purpose aside from propelling Paul's story forward and making him out to be the hero, and I don't like it one bit. I think it reflects poorly on Paul, and I really hope that while he was sitting in that jail cell singing his Jesus songs, somewhere in the back of his mind, the fate of this enslaved woman was gnawing at his conscience. That one of the reasons he was singing those Jesus songs was because he didn't, couldn't sleep due to the feeling that he had not done what he did to better her life. He had done it to better his own. Because you see on either side of this story surrounding the enslaved woman, we see Paul treating people, even women, very differently. Earlier in the chapter, when Paul met Lydia and Lydia's heart was opened to hear God's word, he invited her into the fold of God through the act of baptism. And I just have to say as an aside, I read a commentary that talked about this was a colonizing act, and I wish I could preach on that too, but you know, you got to pick something and stick with it. But someday we all need to take a look at that and explore that aspect of this text as well. Later on in our reading, when Paul and Silas are in jail as they were singing their Jesus songs well into the night, when there was an earthquake so powerful the very foundations of the prison were shaken and the doors of the cells and the chains of the prisoners had fallen off, the jailer, seeing the damage that had been done, assumed that all of the prisoners had escaped and was prepared to die by suicide for he knew he would be in huge trouble if the prisoners were gone. But Paul, our hero, caught him just in time 
time and called out, wait, do not harm yourself. We are all here and accounted for. The jailer in his relief ran into Paul and Silas's cell and fell before them on his knees saying, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you and your household will be saved. Paul then spoke the word of God to the jailer and all in his house, and they were all baptized without delay. These two stories of baptism sandwich the story of the enslaved woman, making her experience with Paul stand in stark contrast. Why is she not offered the same freedom as Lydia and the jailer? Why did Paul not invite this enslaved woman into the fold of God through the act of baptism? He did it for Lydia. He did it for the jailer. Why not for this woman? What was it about her that made her not worthy of such an invitation? What was it that prevented Paul from seeing her as someone who needed to be freed not just from a demon, but from her position in life? What was it about her that provoked Paul to do what he did to just shut her up? Where was the offer of salvation extended to Lydia and to the jailer? Was it because she didn't ask? Because she was in a more vulnerable position than either Lydia and the jailer, and Paul just didn't want to have to go through all the extra work that required? Was it because offering salvation to Lydia and the jailer seemed pretty easy? But it was all so much more complicated with the enslaved woman. Which makes it all the more heartbreaking. Because doesn't it seem that this woman was in more need of salvation than any of the rest? I am troubled by Paul. Because in his dispassionate healing, I see the sterile, unfeeling patterns of bureaucracy. I'm troubled by Paul because in his annoyance, I see how the privileged misunderstand the disadvantaged, and perhaps how I do as well. I'm troubled by Paul because in his flippancy, I see our desire to move on to what we deem important without regard to the desperate needs staring us in the face. I'm troubled by this entire passage because it doesn't appear as though the other people in the story or even the author see anything wrong with how Paul behaved. There is no commentary on the ways in which Paul invited Lydia, a rich woman, and the jailer into the fold of God through the act of baptism and yet didn't extend the invitation to the enslaved woman. I'm troubled by this move because it shows how quickly the way of Jesus deteriorated so soon after his crucifixion and how difficult his way is to follow. Sure, Paul was doing great work in his travels, but I can't help but wonder, would Jesus have left this woman to her own defenses? When Jesus healed, he usually had a word to offer the one he healed. And yet in the case of Paul, he never even said one word to this enslaved woman. His words were for the demon only. Why did Paul's interaction with the woman end once the demon left? Did he not have any recognition of her position as an enslaved person and what that meant for her life? Would this woman know how to be in the world without her gift that enabled men to make money off of her? Would she know how to live like that? Would she know how to be anything other than a woman possessed and malleable property? I'm disappointed in Paul. But then, if I'm honest, I'm also disappointed in myself. Because I'm like Paul. I've done what he did here. I have worked to pacify, to assuage, to heal in order to make myself feel better. To do it more to stop the interruptions in my work in my day because it was more than because it was what I was called to do. And so I'm thankful that while I am called to be a partner of God, partner with God and Jesus in bringing about the realm of God in our midst, I am thankful it's not totally up to me. 
I'm thankful that though it appears the way of Jesus deteriorated some time, not long after his crucifixion, the power of his resurrection is stronger than our human weakness, and the followers of Jesus have been able to find their way back over and over again throughout the centuries. I am thankful that the power of God is stronger than Paul's weakness, than my weakness, than the church's weakness. That the love of Jesus can work through this world even when we fail. And I pray for the power to move in this world. I pray that when Paul called the demon to leave the enslaved woman in the name of Jesus, that the power in that name wove its way through her broken spirit and gave her new life. I pray that her story did not end there with no way for her to make a living and little hope for her survival in this world. I pray that we hear this story and allow it to mend the broken places in ourselves so that we can learn to see the inherent worth of the ones who pester and annoy us, the people we dismiss because they ruffle our feathers or because they are saying something we don't want to hear or because they require a lot of work. And I pray that when we fall short, the power in the name of Jesus will give us courage to try again and to be better and to do better next time that the power of God's compassion nudges us, pricks at our conscience so we look deeper next time, so that when we look at our fellow human beings, when we look at one another, when we see each other, we are able to see the complete person and not the condition in which they are enslaved, be it poverty or mental illness or disability or addiction or grief that we are able to see the power in the name of Jesus that breaks the chains of our enslavement and gives us the promise of hope, healing, and new life.